Um, uh, the eve record it is Adam Dom Sean McCall Eve. I was called it's Bishop Fuller, uh, Bonahers, uh, also here in Manchester. So, my name is John McCall, I'm an Irish poet, um, based here at the University of Manchester. Um, but in my role here today, I am uh, the director of Creative Manchester, and Creative Manchester is a university wide research platform. And we bring together researchers in different fields with our partners across the city region, nationally and internationally on large research projects. And Creative Manchester is really, really delighted to be involved with the Linguistic Diversity Collective. Um, it's been one of the great joys of this job, talking to Tina Brevin and now to Eva schultz Bernd about their support um, for this new collective. Um, so I'm delighted that you're all here. Um, and I'm going to hand over now um, to Professor Tia Cameron Faulkner, who's going to kick the evening off properly. Yeah. It's wonderful to see everyone here today. Thank you so much for coming and sharing this event with us. This is our panel event and a launch of the Linguistic Diversity Collective. So the um, aims of the Diversity Collective are to showcase the research that we do within our department. We look at all the different types of linguistic diversity around the globe and also to make connections locally with all the wonderful institutions and organisations and people that make Manchester such a wonderful, wonderful place to be. I am now going to pass the background on to uh, Dr. Fred Sagner, who's going to lead the panel today. We've got a wonderful panel, which I'll let um, Fred introduce to, and hopefully we'll have time to mix and mingle after the event as well. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, Fred. Thank you very much. <laughs> And uh, thank you all for coming. Is it better now? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for uh, for coming, for attending uh, this event. Uh, I would like to start by asking how many people speak at least two languages? Okay, let's say two, and then three, four, so very much lingual, I'll stop here. A very much lingual audience. Thank you very much for coming. And uh, I would like uh, to start by way of introduction uh, to remind people that there are around 7,000 languages spoken in the world. And there are statistics that suggest that by the end of this century, around 90% uh, of those languages will have disappeared. Now, these statistics are sometimes uh, contested, but even, you know, if you don't believe in them, there is still, you know, the idea that there is a process of language engagement. Languages are dying at an alarming rate, and we are always aware of uh, what's going on. If you compare to uh, the awareness of biodiversity, you know, there is still work to be done uh, in linguistics. But luckily, we have people who are on the ground in universities doing work with communities. We also have um, people, specialists of education, you know, who work, uh, who promote uh, uh, multilingualism uh, in uh, our schools. And to talk about language maintenance, how do we do we um, support those languages? We have invited, you know, all the specialists, linguists. You know, specialists of education. And um, I will start by introducing the panel with uh, John Wilson, who is a Spanish specialist and the head of modern languages and international partnership at Children's University. Uh, sorry, uh, school. I was going to say university. So he's also uh, the partnership lead for the Independent Schools Modern Languages Association. And um, John, you are a co-founder of the World of Languages and Languages of the World Initiative. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you are the author of uh, a book entitled Somos Edu, mm -hmm. Neus and Hassan. I Hassan. Si. I, uh, I Hassan. I Hassan. Si. Oh, Neus I Hassan. Si. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us today. Okay. And um, another member of uh, the World of Initiative, the World of Languages, uh, Languages of the World. Very beautiful acronym, actually. Very beautiful. The best acronym in town. So this is uh, John Clawson, 
and uh, specialists of uh, classical languages who taught uh, classics at uh, Eton for 17 years. Yeah. And uh, you even taught Kwanzi Kwarten. Very exciting. I'm tempted to ask if he, uh, if he has inherited your love for languages. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I hope, I hope he, he, he has and that he's following us online. Okay, I'll just <laughs> Okay. So you were a boy at uh, King's uh, King Edward School in Birmingham when there were only three non white boys. And now the school is 70% plus non white um, um, uh, you know, uh, population and uh, with uh, over 50% of bilingual children, right? So you became a headmaster later, you know, at King uh, Edward School for 10 years until you retired in 2016. And you are also um, a co-founder of the World Initiative. Yeah. Before I forget, you published two books with Cambridge University Press. Uh, one is uh, Herodotus and Persian Wars. And the other one uh, is the translations of uh, Aristophanes' Cloud. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. Now, our third member of the panel, is um, an English as an additional language coordinator during the week uh, at a school in Salford. And at the weekend, she is an Arabic teacher and examiner. So no time to rest. She is the headmaster of the Manchester Arabic School based uh, at uh, William Hume Grammar School. And uh, the Manchester uh, Arabic School is a supplementary school created in 2017 to teach Arabic to children of Arabic origin and also to children of non-Arabic origin and to people who are interested uh, in the language. And uh, she is the founder of the school uh, with the support of her husband and the team of her teacher and uh, staff. Right? We also established uh, two Arabic supplementary schools in Burnett and uh, Salford. Thank you very much um, for joining us. Sorry. That's uh, Munira and uh, Susa. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I forgot your name, but I didn't mention your name. Now, um, near me is um, a lecturer uh, in intercultural um, communication, Leonie Kaiser, at uh, the University of Manchester. He was a specialist of sociolinguistics, ethnography, urban multilingualism, and we did your PhD here at the University of Manchester. Um, and you research uh, Arabic language practices, maintenance uh, at the family level and in supplementary schools and um, in businesses. And you also worked on uh, language uh, provision in Manchester. Okay. And uh, you also coordinated support platform for supplementary schools in Manchester and have worked with a range of community-based initiatives around the theme of language maintenance. So, one of the specialists of language maintenance in the panel. Thank you very much for joining us today. Mm -hmm. And um, the final member of the panel is Professor Julia Saraban from um, uh, SOAS, uh, University of London. Now, Julia has always been fascinated by her uh, language of heritage, uh, journalism, right? <laughs> okay. And uh, that led her to uh, develop a passion for endangered languages, uh, language maintenance, and uh, language attitudes and revitalization. So, uh, Julia, you have published extensively on topics uh, including endangered languages, language attitudes, language planning, and uh, you published a practical guide to language revitalization. And you've worked uh, in different parts of the world with um, uh, various communities. Uh, including the Channel Islands, uh, the Isle of Man. We worked in Thailand, New Zealand, Cook Islands, <laughs> New Caledonia, and the new name. Right? Mm -hmm. So, so thank you very much for joining us today, and um, uh, thank you everyone once again. Now, let me start uh, with Julia, and my first question is: We usually. Um, uh, here, people say, why don't we speak just one language? Why don't we just have one language? Maybe, you know, 
English So why is it important, you know, to preserve a language diversity? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the number of languages in the world, and we talked about the number of languages in this room. But for me, it's not so much about the languages; it's it's about people. It's about the human dimension. Um, and there are lots and lots of benefits, um, personal benefits and societal benefits from, from being multilingual. Um, uh, we can we can point to research, for example, that young children will learn better, not only in their own language, but actually learn um, do better in majority uh, majority languages and other subjects if, if they're multilingual. They'll definitely learn other languages more easily. Um, and, for, and also at the other end of life, um, there's some um, increasing amount of evidence to show that um, it can help actually uh, off, uh, um, stave off the onset of dementia. Once you're, uh, if you are unlucky enough to contract dementia, if you're, if you're bilingual or multilingual, it may be as much as three or five years later than other people that you actually um, really need to come to the, the impact of that. So that there are those are some really practical benefits of, of being multilingual. Um, but on a societal level, um, the loss of languages for the linguists is is a loss of our subject matter, which for us is concerning. But 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 what it represents is actually minoritization of of of, of people of groups. It's linked to political and social and economic marginalization. Um, and so I think if we can um encourage people to take pride in their languages um then it's it's it, it helps it helps with self-confidence um it's been linked with, with well-being there's been research in various parts of the world that being involved in language maintenance language revitalization programs um can uh, reduce the amount of youth suicide can actually uh, is, is correlated with, with rates of diabetes being lower in people who are maintaining their heritage language. There's a lot of, it, of interest now in, in things like language and well-being. So it's not just about dry linguistic stuff. It's actually about real well-being for humans, and for, for, for individuals and for communities. Um, one of my colleagues in New Zealand, uh, Jeanette King, has been doing research into motivations for language being involved in language maintenance and revitalization revitalization activities. And people are saying things like, it's not just me revitalizing the language, the language is revitalizing me. And this is my own experience. Um, as I said, so I've always been fascinated it with my language. My mother told me it was holding us back, you know, but actually for me, it's been the best of my career. And I found real joy in learning the language, getting in touch with my heritage, keeping my culture going um, and, 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 and just speaking my language, it's, 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 I recommend it to everybody, you know, there, there's, a, there's a hierarchy of languages, we know that in our society. Um, people will say things like, oh, it's better to learn a really important language like Spanish or English or something, but um, you can learn those as well, you don't have to give up your home language. That's my real, uh, really point I want to get across here is, Everyone can be multilingual. Multilingualism is the norm in the world. You don't have to give up your heritage language to be competent in, in another language. In fact, it will help you. So, so you're you're the example of someone who has, I was going to say, lost the heritage language, but actually did not acquire it in the first place. No, I recovered it. Yeah, you recovered it yeah. after yeah. it was lost. I, I, I heard it when I was young. Um, I, so I your mother was speaking. Yeah? I think it was at things like Sunday school picnics, the older people would speak it. Yeah. Because that, that I I'm I I'm I was the gen generation after the generation that didn't pass it on. And that's very common that that generation wants the language back. Hmm. So you wanted the language back yeah. and you learned it. Yeah. And now you became a language linguist uh, yeah. from, from that. So you talked about language maintenance hmm. and language revitalization. For the general public, you seem to make a distinction between uh, okay, the yeah, two. Yeah. How do you distinguish? What do you maintain? Uh, when do you maintain a language? When do you revitalize one? And uh, it's something to do with well, how many people speak it and who speaks it. Um, um, there was a famous a linguist or a certain linguist called Joshua Fishman, and he said that which is not maintained in the family can't 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 can't, can't, can't be passed on. It's all to do with. Basically, who speaks the language in your family? 
Is it the grandparents, the parents, the children? So if, if the language is still strong in the community and you want to keep it that way, then you have to maintain it. Um, and but if it's in my say my situation as in many, as you said, many, many communities in the world, um, it's not being passed on to children. At that point, you need to try and revitalize and reclaim the language. So okay, so we have a situation where the language exists. You know, it's still alive, but yeah. you want to maintain it. Yeah, yeah. And the situation where you will revitalize it. Yeah. So in the case in urban context, mm -hmm. for example, you will talk more about you know, maintaining the language if the language well, is not yeah. inherited. It's just, in many, many communities, you've got the same things going on. You've got negative attitudes towards uh, minority languages. You've got um, parents saying, oh, we need to, we, uh, you need to go to school in English, so we won't teach you our language. A lot of, a lot of, when I hear that a lot, I think, oh, alarm bells ring. Yeah. So if people stop speaking the language at home or the children of the tribe of the parents, they think it's not cool to speak their heritage language. Yeah. So can I, can yeah. I understand? Yeah. We were talking earlier about um, uh, in places like Manchester, and I'm come from Birmingham, where there are still grammar schools. So that was an immense amount of competition to get into the grammar schools. And therefore, children from the age of five or six mm -hmm. are dedicating themselves to learning English so they can pass their verbal reasoning tests or whatever it is and so uh, in, in an incredibly multilingual city mm. english is still holding um, everybody in their thrall yeah. and the, the concentration on english yeah. is that must be contributing to the attrition of the heritage languages and the product because the family yeah. is saying no you can't speak our language you've got to speak English to increase your chance of getting into a grammar school. But ironically, their brain plasticity would be improved if they stayed multilingual. Yeah. yeah. So actually, they got into better. So, so if you take the situation in Manchester, Leone, you have worked in Manchester, you have done research um, uh, in social relationships, yeah. in um, supplementary schools, and in families. My first question is how multilingual is Manchester? If I brought someone from outside the UK, maybe from where I come from, they might think that you only you will only find you know English as a language in the UK and in Manchester. So how much English is Manchester? Well, Manchester has been referred to as one of the most linguistically diverse cities in Western Europe, China. considering the size of the city. And it is extremely diverse if you think about the fact that among around population of around 550,000 we find between 150 and 200 languages in the city if you want to, to, to put a number on this. But I'd also like to emphasize here at this point that it's very difficult to count languages. It's very difficult to identify, to categorize, to identify the boundaries between languages and dialect in many cases. Um, if you think about, for example, Chinese, um, if we just take Cantonese and Mandarin, do we take them, do we count them as two languages or do we count them as just one language, Chinese? Mm -hmm. And that's the difficulty also when we look at quantitative data sets um, on language practices in the city. So it is difficult to really um, map um, linguistic diversity, but what we can definitely find in Manchester is an extremely diverse range of languages spoken ranging from um, global languages that have international currency that are globally important um, and recognized really as important Arabic, French, Portuguese, and um, many, many languages. But then we also find languages that are official languages in some countries, um, Urdu, Hindi, um, many other languages. Then we find languages that are often um, regarded as smaller languages that are spoken in particular regions or areas in the world and um, some that are minority or minoritized languages and some um, that are non-territorial languages that are not necessarily associated with a particular um, place of origin or a particular nation state. So really there is a big diversity but it is sometimes very difficult um, from a quantitative perspective to really map and understand the numbers because of course um, numbers change, changing migration patterns and so on. And then again, it's difficult to really count. Okay, so so um, you have worked on um, language maintenance in Manchester. And you have mentioned language maintenance, and I presume that in your case, it was in smaller areas, right? Or is it like in big, as big as Manchester? Uh, is well, it in it's urban or rural areas? Urban areas mostly, yes. Yeah. You have not worked in rural areas. 
expected your work in uh you know around the world at least uh, yes i have i've worked in rural areas yeah, yeah. so so my my the, point, the question i wanted to ask leone and maybe to you later is you know uh what kind of language maintenance activities have you been involved in in manchester that could also apply to you actually well, one of them, and that's probably the most obvious setting, is the family setting. Um, we've done quite a lot of research looking at family language policies. Mm -hmm. How do parents um, in multilingual families work to make sure that um, their languages are passed on to their children? And obviously, it's not as passive as this now sounds. Mm -hmm. um, they really um, often have very interesting and, and well thought through policies in place in their homes to make sure um, they teach. Um, speaking and writing, listening and reading often to their children. And then another very interesting setting that you've actually also mentioned before in your introduction is the supplementary school setting. So these are these um, out of hours or weekend, um, often called Saturday schools or complementary schools um, that teach um, what's often called heritage languages and to children alongside their mainstream schools. And um, so that's an an incredibly interesting setting really to work in and to get insights into because there's these schools range in sizes between um maybe five to ten students with pupils mm -hmm. working and meeting in a library um and then also to larger schools 200 mm -hmm. um be between 200 and 300 pupils for example where you get also 40 50 teachers and it really feels like a normal school um, but it is much more than that. It is um, much more than simply um, teaching language. So I'm sure Munira will be able to say much more about this. <laughs> so, what are, but before I go to Munira, what are the practical you know, activities at the home level? You know, what do people do practically mm -hmm. you know, to maintain the language in a place like Manchester where there is you know, pressure from English you know, mm -hmm. for people to speak English when, you know, before they go to school? Well, that's actually a very good point that you're raising. Of course, um, there's always this negotiation between the importance to acquire English um, for a first um, generation of the Asian family and also the, the, the importance of maintaining the languages that, that people bring with them. And there's various ways really in which people um, work to maintain their languages, and that can be um, through informal language classes on weekends, for example, where it's often the mother and um, teachers um, often reading and writing to the children. And then, as I mentioned before, really policies um, where parents want to, to maintain the, the heritage language as the spoken language in the home. Um, then there will be um, what we often refer to as linguistic landscapes, so written language on science. And that's usually linguistic landscape research usually focuses on the public space. But when we look into multilingual family homes, we will find quite a lot of written language practices. And this again supports. How does it, how does it, how does it happen in the home? That would be, be for example, Kitchen labeling uh, spices on the jars. So. Like in Arabic, for example, exactly. you write the, the name of the teacup. Exactly. Or the bowl. How do you say a bowl in Arabic and you write it on the bowl? Yes. Exactly. In the last table. Yes. And that's the oh, thing. So oh, way of oh. teaching children. In, in, in different spaces or also religious practices. Yes. Um, and, and, and songs, uh, uh, nursery rhymes, stories, mm -hmm. uh, videos, um, yeah, also um, 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 talking with the grandparents online, um, yeah. So talking to the grandparents online during meals, for example? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, Munira, to come to you. So you have worked, uh, you have created a school, and you are, you are the head teacher you know, of the Arabic school. My first question is, what motivated you? You know, to start, um, uh, you know, the, the school teaching Arabic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, the first thing I would say, I'm, I'm very young. Uh, um, I have my family here, and when my children were young, uh, I wanted them to learn the language, and that was the main thing for me uh, in every single activity in the house or outside our home. So the first thing I've done when they were young is exposing them to the language, speak the language, posters. Uh, take them abroad to your uh, country of origin. It's really important to keep in touch with that country. As you said, uh, stories, uh, parents, uh, relatives, etc. And uh, then, of course, I'm going to relate now to the five things that we teach the, uh, the languages. And it's, it's all, 
keep it or maintain in a language that starts the, when the, the family first. So if the parents are the people who live with that child, uh, it's their one to help them to maintain their language, their home language. Uh, and then they move to the school. I work in a school where more than 45 languages spoken. So the first thing we do when we have new, new students coming into our school, we just assess them. We assess their English and we assess their first language and we uh, the, the mother tongue. I mean. So uh, if they have a good command of their mother language, we straight away uh, encourage them to sit for the GCSC. So we convince them that doing a GCSC in your own mother language is a bonus because you are having an edge over other students. Not everyone can do a GCSE in a second language. So this is another different way to encourage those bilingual children to maintain the language and keep learning, speaking it, and reading about it. And that would be our Not necessarily a big old language. Mm -hmm. So last year, where I work, we, uh, I think it was seven languages uh, tested for the GCSE, Russian, Romanian, Spanish, Portuguese, Punjabi, Urdu, Chinese, the traditional one. So they were all they were like bilingual children, but in part of their work, we encouraged them to do the GCSD and they did wonderfully. We're talking about eights and nines. So it was really, really good. It was worth it to have an extra GCSD. And that's accepted at the national level. Yeah, yeah. According to Excel, you work at the Excel, yes, they do uh, and do for that. Uh, so yes, so this is another way. Uh, to maintain the language. When we say language, we say the, the culture, the heritage. So you are maintaining not just the language, because that language brings, uh, brings a whole culture that people wouldn't know about the culture without saying it's speaking that language. So uh, it's the school, the school uh, it is important. And what we do on uh, Saturday, which is the supplementary school, and it's not just an educational setting, I would say it's more a, a social one as well because it brings people who speak the same language together and it connects them unbelievably in a, in a very, very nice way. This is where all the friendship starts between people who live in the same well, same city, but they don't know each other. But when they bring their children to the Arabic school, they meet, they meet each other and you know a great relationship develop from there and the children, they have friends. And most importantly, I would say, when children who come to a supplementary school feeling proud of their language, of culture, of heritage, they have that sense of belonging. And I think this is extremely important mm -hmm. if you want to bring up students, children who have a sense of belonging to a culture, a language, because that gives them some security. Just the sense of belonging to a language, culture, absolutely. So give them confidence and that makes them feel secure. So yes, I've got my language, I've got my culture, I feel happy within myself, I can move forward, I can do wonders, plus my English language, of course. Where are the children? Where are they? Where do they generally originate from? People who come to the school to learn Arabic? Well, more, most of the Arabic countries, I would say, Arabic countries. as a world, and even from some Asians. And uh, I had English people who are a German people. <laughs> so what's, interesting, what's interesting here is that you have people from different uh, Arabic yes. countries yeah. speaking different varieties of Arabic. And they come to school to learn Arabic. Yes. What uh, variety of Arabic do you teach? Uh, you mean the language? Uh, why do we learn? No, no, no. Language? So, so, so uh, what that, dialect of Arabic? Uh, this is a, a, a bit confusing for some parents. We try to use the formal one, not so, the Egyptian, not the Moroccan, not the Bedou Bedouin one. <laughs> That's what we stick yes. to the formal one that is. Uh, known for most Arabic speakers, so we avoid dialects, although sometimes it's difficult, but we avoid dialects. So you avoid the home languages? No, I wouldn't call it a language, it's the... the uh, home varieties. Yes, yeah. so. but so, interesting, so. sorry, it's, it's interesting enough, we, we start, because we're mixing, we're seeing in, in each other, we say, we start to learn, for example, um, from uh, Palestine. So I start to speak the, the Libyan accent and I learn some vocabulary. And again, this is another way to connect people. So I can say, sit down in three, four words that in Arabic, that means sit down. So this down is sit down, you know, you know what I mean? So you can, you, you learn. And this is how you become very familiar. So if your students are mainly, for example, Libyan, I might myself, although I'm not Libyan, I might use a couple of words 
so I can communicate with each other and make them feel that I'm welcome in my class and I know a bit about you. So this is what's interesting about it. Uh, yeah, we have to work in a this school. But again, we have them um, from different countries. And uh, one of the questions of the DCSD is why do we learn Arabic? So we try and make them uh, not the language learning for different purposes. Uh, and so, for example, for a technical reason, you can find a job if you speak an extra language, or if you keep in touch with your family when you go abroad to speak to your grandparents. So, the most, most important thing is to make them feel proud and encourage them and just push them as much as you can to like that language, Arabic or other languages, and you know, feel proud of it. It's, it's a must, I think. That's very interesting. I think the, the question of Arabic, what I wanted to get at is the, um, the whole fact that you have classical Arabic. Yes. And uh, when you were teaching it, I was wondering what the version. The well, formal. The formal. Yes. The formal. Yes. Okay. So um, let's look at another um, you know, attempt to promote languages in schools. And that's the very exciting, you know, one of initiative. And uh, John, my first question, John um, um, Dalton, my first question is, how did the idea of Polo come about? Thanks, Serge. Um, could I just say, first of all, that I am an imposter and also a dinosaur um, in terms of being somebody taught Latin and Greek. And, and, and reach. I'm not even a teacher anymore, I'm a retired teacher. Um, but um, one of the reasons why I'm involved is because um, uh, and this has some relevance, is that when we were trying to think about one, the first connection we made with Manchester University was through a man called Andrew Brody, who um, supported, uh, has been a very substantial donor to King Edward School Birmingham, but also to Manchester University Language Department in providing funding for disadvantaged pupils to do languages. Um, it's very interesting that Andrew um, himself was a German migrant with his family in probably some pretty dark term, dark times. So he's always been deeply committed to um, trying to support languages. And of course, he is an example of somebody who, having migrated this country, has um, had a remarkable career. Um, in terms of Wallow, I, um, I'd just like to, in a funny kind of a way, um, it's almost the fundamental question, going back to what we talked about. When I was a boy at King Edwards in 1970, as I say, there were three non-white boys out of 800. And the only uh, language diversity would have been similarly um, Central European migrants, where uh, the boys would have um, come with their families, uh, or their families would have migrated um, in the middle of the uh, 20th century. When I came back to be chief master of King Edwards, and King Edwards is to Birmingham what Manchester Grammar School is to uh, Manchester, except better. Um, <laughs> the, in 10 years of headship, I didn't address this simple point, which was once upon a time, there might have been 10 or 15 boys in the school who spoke a language other than English. And when I came back, and by, certainly by the time we left, we were 50% at least bilingual and 70-75% uh, non-white. Indeed, our applicants were about 90% from what might be described as ethnic minorities, but actually in Birmingham are now ethnic majorities. And yet, in those 50 years, what were we teaching them in languages? We were still teaching them exactly the same curriculum, uh, French uh, and Spanish and Latin, and if they were very lucky, Greek. But these boys coming to King Edward and similarly boys and, and girls coming into primary schools are arriving to be taught in the national in the national curriculum in key stage two are being taught perhaps a bit of french or a bit of spanish probably to no great avail but each one of these pupils is being asked to leave their family language their heritage language their culture their history at the classroom door. Did I ever, as a teacher at King Edward, say to the say to the boys and so they the boys at a boy school, you know, what are your family, um, you know, what are your family or your linguistic origins? I felt like we changed our history curriculum. So the first thing we started with was for the boys to talk about their family histories, 
rather than about the Tudors or about the Battle of Hastings. So that was progress to some degree. So I suppose while I grew up with uh, working with several people, including John, who is uh, not an imposter and is um, a Manchester uh, a graduate as well as everything else, what we thought was, couldn't we invent a program, a course, which instead of teaching them a single language, probably very imperfectly, which actually allowed the pupils to bring their own languages into school so that we would try to teach about how languages work so we understand that each language has a grammar and how might that differ. We try to make them interested in the history of languages. Why is English made up of this extraordinary hybrid diversity and also how many other languages are coming from the empire? Um, and we try to make them think that languages are very closely related to every single other subject helps you to understand the etymology, um, the etymology of words. And also it allows these people to go back to your points about pride and belonging. It gives those people's chance. Instead of the teacher just teaching them what they know, which is what I've done for 40 odd years, the great didactic method. The great thing is in these lessons, we can say to the kids, well, let's have a look at days of the week. Why is today Wednesday? And why is it like what it is in French or in German? But also, why don't you go home and come back tomorrow and you tell us about the linguistic, cultural, religious origins of your, what you call, days of the week? And you can do this in many, many different ways. And uh, perhaps John will talk about what he's been doing with, with his pupil. So what we've done is try to devise a course. And we didn't mean to do this, and we didn't mean to end up in a language, whatever it is, diversity um, collective. But in the end, we inadvertently, we have invented a course which is trying to do the things which you as academics are talking about. And what we would hope is, and this is primarily a primary course, but it doesn't have to be that way. We would hope that students might arrive in secondary school infused by languages, valuing languages, more attached to their heritage languages, so they may want to develop it and continue it. We've been talking about Arabic, but a number of boys in the you know, King Edwards is a 30% Muslim school. A large number of boys would be going after school to learn the Quran. In what way did we ever build on that linguistic stuff? Rather than just reciting it well, why can't we make sure they get a GCSE in it or an A level and then go to SOAS, um, you know, which must be the right place for them rather than medical school? Um, uh, and so we would hope that the pupils, therefore, would arrive in secondary school keen on learning other languages, but also really valuing what they have and keeping that continuity with their own history. Because what you're saying is one of the great dangers in Birmingham is if I'm a little boy or girl trying to get into grammar school, I might learn English to get into grammar school, but I can't speak to my grandparents. Because they're not speaking my language, and I'm only speak, and I, I'm not speaking their language, uh, uh, and they don't, and I only know English, and they don't know English so well. And certainly in Birmingham, the whole family thing is important because when I was a little boy in Birmingham uh, fifty odd years ago, it was a multiracial city. But actually now, it is more multiracial, but more divided because communities are now living much more in self-contained areas. So even amongst the adults, there are much greater limitations. 50 years ago, you would have to learn English to live in Birmingham. Today, that was not the case. So that's what we invented. Uh, and it, it, as you can see, it started out of a hippopotamus. Um, but, um, uh, so that's where it came from. That's so cool. That's a great idea. And hopefully, you know, those children will actually come up to the linguistic department. You know, after, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> I don't know any. Sure. I, I don't know any linguistic. Tech. We're discussing. I've thought we're going to grow. The law for languages will grow from. Uh, uh, I still don't know what more people. And then, and then, and then, feed. So later, you can feed. I would have to If you're very nice, sure. if you're very nice to me. <laughs> but I suppose, in a way, so, it's a. It is, a, in a way, it's a linguistics course in making kids think about languages and how they work and how they're related. Although I think we've, as far as possible, we think the word linguistics tends to scare seven-year-olds. Um, so it scares me. Um, and so we're always talking about languages in the plural. Um, 
uh, awareness, and that's why wine is what it is, because it's part of show the relationship between languages in the plural and the world. So that, that's, that's the origin. So John Wilson, what languages have you managed to introduce in the curriculum, and what are your oh. targets? Okay, um, can I just add to what John said first? So, and there'll be people in the room who perhaps aren't familiar with the curriculum load out for languages in the UK, because part of creating war as well was addressing, trying to address a problem. And the problem is that primary, language in primary schools, in some contexts, are done brilliantly, and students make really good progress, albeit maybe in one or two languages. There are other examples where particular primary school is set in a particular um, language context, and that school really goes to town in, in really being relevant to that language community that that primary school represents, and do brilliant work as well. There are other primary schools where, because the key stage two curriculum says, uh, states that that makes some progress in a language, they sort of tick a box for languages, they maybe have a French day when the, when the kids all come dressed in their it's it, as stereotypes and and that box of tits and that's their not a languages but, and everything in between. So the variety is massive. So let's let's just imagine three people coming. Uh, I'm a year seven teacher, the first year of senior school, I'm about to start my Spanish lesson in September. The reality is, student number one has come from the school where. They have made, they've been doing Spanish for five years. They've made, this student made massive progress. Student number two, well, in their school, it was in a part of Manchester where they were really celebrating, um, the, 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 their school had a high, high portion of uh, young people, uh, Urdu speakers, and their priority was really integrating into that community, being relevant to that community. So, yeah, they've made a really good progress with Urdu, that language, which is not the language of that student's home, has been celebrated. So that student's coming in as well into my Spanish lesson. Then student number three, they did that French day. It wasn't in Spanish, it was just one day. And now they're all in the same class. And you might have Chinese where they studied yeah, Chinese yeah. for four hours a week for four years. So those students are all in the same class. And their language learning journey in secondary school starts with being demotivated. Each of those students is demotivated for three very different reasons. And that's just not idea. It's not what you want as a teacher. It's not what you want for celebrating languages in your school. Okay. So we looked at, okay, what is, why are things not done well in primary schools? And it ultimately boils down to resource and priorities, that sort of thing. Okay. Some schools are lucky enough to have a language teacher and can, and can, and can have that specialist, uh, a spell that, that, that and can encourage that specialist um, um, get progress in that in that in the certain language. So what we wanted to do is okay, let's provide something that all primary school teachers, albeit with a bit of um, support and training, can deliver. And the, the thing about what we created is we're not going in answer because we're not getting really deep into any language. We are we are just making our students aware of that language diversity. We are being we the course enables our teachers to be flexible in their approach and adapt to the specific context in front of them with regard to that because every single school is set in a different sort of linguistic context. I mean, I'm not even the right terminology again, <laughs> but and that's whereas our our the, this, the national curriculum doesn't sort of doesn't allow for that. Okay, so the way I teach it because you know I am a Hispanist at heart, and I used to see language teaching very much through the lens of how brilliant Spanish is and how I want to get everyone speaking Spanish. Now, probably since I became head of languages, I'm now looking at it more holistically, thinking, no, it's about celebrating languages as a whole. It's when parents come to oh, which one's the most important? Which one shall I, which one's my? And I sort of just bat that question back to the parents, they look for the student even better, back to that, what's most important to you? What's most relevant to you? And your context, okay. It might be that a student wants to uh, communicate with grandma, okay. And with, it might be that yes, in my school, there's some privileged kids. It might be, oh yes, you have a villa in Malaga, for example. Okay, so what is relevant to you in your context? Not, not, ooh, 
well, how can I earn the most money? Because such a, because of the, that, I just, you know, I like to think of the cultural context of the thing. So the answer is that the teachers can be flexible depending on where they are, sort of language specialism that rests, but also flexible with regards to the context that the students are learning in. And what the idea is, is then that when they arrive in year seven, okay, they haven't made lots of progress in any individual language unless they have another language, okay? However, what they are, they are seeing, as Bill mentioned, they're seeing that different languages connect in different ways. They are seeing that uh, languages aren't designed to be translated. So you can't just say well, why you can't just stick it to Google Translate and hope for the best all over. And um, why, um, the, how languages are very interdisciplinary in their approach, and which is which is really really works for a primary school setting because if you can think of um, this this a, a multi uh, holistic language course can link to uh, RS classes, it can link to geography, it can link to history, it can link to science. It it very appealing from that sense to 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 uh, to the primary school specialist, and then hopefully our students arrive in year seven. Knowing that, oh yes, I've been put in the French class, I've been put in the German class, I've been put in the Spanish class, but actually I can see the bigger picture. I can see that yes, I've started off as a German learner, a Spanish learner, a French learner, but I can see where this is going. I can see that how language connects. I can become sort of lifelong linguist, linguist. Um, yeah, whether that takes you into a linguistics department, great, or whatever. But that's sort of where the thinking is. I think in a way, yeah. the, number, the number of languages you can cover is a bit like your school. Depends on the number of languages there are inside the kids. So, in a way, if you're this kind of thing, you can say to every kid, you know, if you're doing an Indo European language, you can talk about mother, father, brother, etc. You go, you tell me what these words, if you don't know yourself, go and find out. And so, therefore, you know, what we had in the lesson I taught, we had a Russian boy, and we were discussing days of the week, and he talked about days of the week in Russian, and then he spent a lesson teaching us all the Cyrillic alphabet. Um, so, once again, you may never do end up doing Russian, but at least all the pupils thought, well, actually, it's not impossible to use a different script. And I can actually chip into that. So a little bit of Greek can show you some etymologies and cinemas and dinosaurs, um, if you know what I mean. And, and the kids can then think, actually, I can decode this. And maybe one of the other things you can do is to encourage not just learning, but also understanding and curiosity and, dare I say, thought. <laughs> so, and, so. When you look at like in the work you're doing, a lot of it basically is based, maybe not based, but it is on the European languages that are present, that are written, right? Not necessarily, because we have minority languages represented in your school. No, I mean, uh, once again, in, a, in, a, in Birmingham, with, uh, I was fascinated that you say the dominant language in your school is Portuguese in Birmingham, because most of the Birmingham migrants are Asians from the uh, North Indian Pakistan partition diaspora, mm -hmm. then they speak a wide range of different languages, Bihari, Potwari, Mirpuri, um, Urdu, Punjabi, Gujarati, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I think it's quite interesting for those kids to bring those languages in and think about where did their families come from? How do these languages, how do these languages relate? And also, there's a very, for example, a growing um, a Somali community in Birmingham, uh, so we're on the going. So once again, getting pupils from with their Asian family languages, which are completely different, um, is also fascinating. And but once again, enables those people to talk about their family story, and also enables the people who do not know African language to think, I now understand something a bit more about Africa and about how languages live in families and so on. So to that extent. However many languages that kids in the school speak, you can, by using this flexible job, because it's not prescriptive, but there's no assessment with it at the moment. It's merely an exploration. It's merely so improving to, uh, you know, contributing to improving the visibility. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. of those languages. And, and regard given to them. And therefore, hope, yeah, exactly. And that if you know it, that has an impact on language maintenance and people who speak minority languages. I mean, that's hard to measure. Well, we're, we're just about to set out on that process. This is only year two of it being taught. Okay. All we can say is, as John would say, that many teachers who've been not entirely thrilled by their capacity to teach uh, primary school languages have been cheered up. Certainly, I've been teaching for 40 years and I've never enjoyed lessons as much as some of these 
lessons that we've done. I've never taught fine school kids before, and I'm very old. Okay. So it's young. And it's very clear. Yeah. Um, so my school is in Cheadle Hume, and in theory, we are part of Greater Manchester, and but we don't always see and hear that language diversity that Naya was talking about within within Greater Manchester. So up to two hundred languages spoken. But I certainly wanted my students to be aware of that and to celebrate that. So with things like, I don't know if you've seen the Made in Manchester poem, absolutely fantastic. You haven't on YouTube, that was brilliant, looking at the language diversity to celebrate Manchester. Um, and I also wanted them to sort of question their attitude to this language diversity rather than within Manchester, rather than trying to sort of you know, stay away from it, try and embrace it, show that curiosity. Next time they're on the train or the bus and they hear another language, ask about it. What was that you saying? Teach me some words. So it's not just a course for those who are multilingual. It's a course for those who are interested in multilingualism. I think, um, um, so, and, and so, so that, that would be the thing. And actually what it's done is, my perception that our community wasn't very linguistically diverse was actually wrong as well, because thanks to this, um, those, the, there is more language diversity than my school than I thought, okay? Whether it's connections with Ireland, whether it's connections with, um, oh, there's a language that I do speak at home, but for the reasons like John said, we decided not to put it on the admissions documentation for the school. We decided not to mention that because we thought it might count against us, sort of thing. Um, so it sort of unearthed a lot of diversity that we didn't know was there and that we can now celebrate. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. So, Munira, uh, I wanted to ask you the same question. Is there, can you tell as a member of the community, the, uh, the community of Arabic speakers and uh, a teacher? Can you tell whether there is a positive impact you know, of teaching Arabic in like, you know, daily interaction between like, you know, Arabic uh, people of Arabic descent? Yeah. And the other question I wanted to ask is if you see a difference between generations, so between older generations and the younger generation in the use of uh, Arabic, especially after the younger generation has started the Yeah, of course, um, the first question, uh, definitely there is uh, a lot of uh, positive um, results from speaking the uh, Arabic language within the same community. And people are so keen at the moment to learn Arabic, uh, and maybe uh, Chinese or Mandarin um, as a, a second language for a economical reason. Everyone wants to go to uh, Dubai. Everyone wants to work there. So they think, you know, speaking Arabic, even non Arab, you know, different uh, people with different backgrounds, they want to learn the Arabic language so they can go travel and find a, a good job or overseas in Emirates or somewhere else. So this is um, one thing that people are keen, especially the children who were born in this country, they want. So they, they want to learn Arabic because they want to try and live in the country of their parents, of their country of origin. So for them, it is important to learn the language so they can go and use it in the, uh, in the countries. Uh, it does bring people together on the social side. It definitely it does. And, uh, there, isn't, um, there isn't a lot of uh, social activities going on uh, within the Arabic community. So the Arabic school, to be honest, brings all those parents together where they can, uh, as I said earlier, where they can exchange uh, information about different things, asking about schools, about the best uh, school in there. So it does bring people together to, uh, you know, to speak the language and of course to, keep, to stay in touch with each other. And the second question was, um, what was it about? So it was about, um, uh, I think I'm so bad. <laughs> 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 I was told, I was told really hoping, but, yeah. but uh, yeah. no, but the different generations. Yes, yeah. uh, it, yeah, uh, there, there would be a new, uh, a difference. As we talked earlier, that in other countries, you will see the signs on the shops, they are all in English. So now the children were speaking with their parents or black parents, but every now and then they will insert an English word. Because, you know, they've lived this language and we cannot deny, you know, the influence of the English language on their language. So it would be like uh, uh, six, seven words of Arabic and then the other uh, words of English, yeah. So that uh, the, the, the word goes up, they wouldn't say, so what is that? What do you say? They would say, you know, in a, in a funny way. So uh, even in our countries, the other words I'm sorry, I'm talking about, there, there's a lot of uh, concern, a lot of the, um, uh, be 
people are so keen to learn the English language in our hearts. And I think this is one of the aspects that maybe even eventually help in, in other language to die. Because in, back in, in the Arabic speakers in the, in the country of origin, they're so keen to learn the English language and, and even they are forgetting their own language. Mm -hmm. But when we go back to our countries, they are like shocked. How can we speak the Arabic language? I'm, I'm so keen for my child to speak Arabic and I wanted to speak Arabic, but they want to speak English to him. And I don't want that. <laughs> because this is like, you know, uh, contradicts all that I'm doing in here. So, uh, yes, it, 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 sometimes it is a bit difficult to communicate uh, in Arabic within our family or friends because, as I said, English is taken over. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a universal language. Everyone wants to speak English, wants to text in English. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it depends really on how you uh, control the children. So when the children come to your school, do their parents speak Arabic to them? After they've been to school, does it include that they have an impact on the family level? Yes. That's basically what I'm trying to yeah. do. So you have, you're basically doing your language maintenance, let's say, yeah. at the school level. Now, what's the impact of the home level? That's what I'm trying to get at. Because the, the parents, they wouldn't bring their children into our school unless they are keen to. For the, but with the parents, they would. They would speak as a teacher. Because I see situations where parents would like to have the children speak their language, yeah. but they don't speak the language to them. The front of, and uh, I'll take them to the school hoping that the school will reflect yeah. the family, but it doesn't yeah. happen. Well, it has to be the other way around. Uh, you're ignoring here, we're not talking about language, we're talking about four skills. So they do it at home, and the parents who work with the children homework and they keep in touch with them. They do. Uh, listen because you know they got Arabic uh, at home. Now speaking, as uh, Julian mentioned earlier, some children are embarrassed to speak Arabic in front of strangers. So when they are with the parents in their home, trust me, they speak yes, Arabic. But yes. outside, exactly. They, they don't want to be uh, embarrassed. And this is again something we, mm -hmm. as you know, teachers, we need to make sure it, it's not there and just you know push them. It's your language. Be proud of it. And you know, it, it, it's it's yours, it's your heritage. It's you wanted to say something about this? Yeah, I like to, you're, you're an English teacher, um, and many, many other English teachers around the world. Um, there's a big organization called TESOL, Teachers of English, just because of other languages, and they very much in favor of maintaining home languages and heritage languages because they recognize that, that, that doing that is a firm base. You have to know where you're coming from in order to know where you're going. Yeah, so it's, uh, that, that's a firm base on which to learn other languages such as English. And that, and that, that there is, a, you know, there is research, as I said, to show that you do better. There's some other research which is quite interesting, um, about focusing on, for example, what I call modern foreign languages, mm -hmm. European languages, because it's hierarchy again. Um, I've had the, even, even where I work at SAMUS, it was a school of Oriental and African languages. Somebody referred to modern languages and Arabic. <laughs> Arabic is a modern language. <laughs> but, but no, I can have digress there. Um, yeah. So, in, the, the, this guy, Mike Brokaw from Southampton, I don't know if you know him. Um, he was doing some research because we, we do say this mantra that if you speak, if you're already bilingual, it's easier to learn another language, you do better. Um, but some of the children that he was working with had always been put down for being bilingual, and they said, we're not valued for being bilingual, why should we learn another language? You know, you, you don't care whether I speak or why should I learn French? Because it has not done me any good already to be bilingual. So it's, 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 it's valorizing the children, it's, it's, as it, you it, say, putting the, putting value on, on, on their skills, yeah. I'm being told that the time is uh, so, but uh, I wanted to ask uh, before we go, you know, we worked on language provision uh, in different services. Can you tell us about it very quickly? Before I ask you about uh, your number one advice, everyone, your number one advice to people who want to work on maintaining you know, their languages at home. So very quickly. I'm trying um, to keep it very short. So in this beautifully multilingual city um, where all these languages of course bring many advantages and assets um, in a way a very linguistically diverse population also brings some challenges in terms of provision of public services, for example. Um, how do you talk to your doctor, to your GP if they're not very proficient in English? So um, I've been looking at interpreting and translation provisions, for example, in healthcare settings, 
um, the challenges, challenges there um, in terms of um, effective provision of interpreting services to make sure that information um, can come across as it should. And of course, in the healthcare setting, it's just one of the examples of many, many settings where, where language provisions are, are right. So, um, it can sometimes really be a question of life or death if, if particular information is understood correctly or not. And again, the challenges of identifying languages, identifying um, someone's um, particular spoken dialect mm -hmm. here and matching that with the right interpreter with the mm -hmm. matching language repertoire. Um, mm -hmm. It is much more difficult than just say someone is, if we stick with Arabic, someone is an Arabic speaker, we need an Arabic interpreter. Um, so um, that's in a nutshell. So you, 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 you use a uh, speech of an Arab variety, that's not necessarily very intimate uh -huh. because it's another one. Exactly. That could lead to a wrong diagnosis in the hospital. It might. If, I mean, in addition, then people might speak French or Spanish or whatever, even if we're in the wider context of this. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, uh, the last question. Uh, number one advice, what would be your number one advice? advice? We walked around the world. Just, just speak your language. <laughs> uh, the, the, this is just as simple as that. You know, and give a world tour, and then yeah. the number one <laughs> advice is for people yeah. speak but, your but language. But also, you know, turn that around. Don't see multilingualism as a problem. See being an interpreter as a valid career path. And you know, if it, this is something that you, know, you can make money from. Yeah? yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if you have children of um, school age, then I would definitely advise you or families that you know or neighbors mm -hmm. to speak to mainstream school teachers mm -hmm. and tell them about your language skills, the resources that your children have and bring to the school and actually create space in the classroom and also to, to ask about supplementary school. That's something that we have heard of a lot, that often mainstream school teachers are not aware of the many language mm -hmm. skills of their pupils and of the fact that they might attend supplementary schools or what supplementary schools even are. And I think that's really mm -hmm. vital to connect these two education settings. Thank you. The language, it starts at home, family, with your family, friends, so that people you do have influence over each other. Stay in touch with your country of origin. Write, read, speak, and listen for skills for your not just for English, for your uh, mother tongue as well, your home language. Thank you very much, John. Well, also, the first thing you can do is have a postcard about more, <laughs> um, but I don't do adverts. And John's got a very good book as well. But, um, <laughs> yeah. All I would like to say, we're very grateful for coming. The link with Manchester University has been very valuable. Um, only yesterday, I was in talking to people at Aston University who were trying to do something um, similar. But I think at the moment, the government sees languages, they think about English, and they think about EAL, and they think about modern foreign languages, and they worry a tiny bit about heritage languages. But the idea that they might actually put these things together and have a coherent plan that reflects the extraordinary multilingualism and diversity um, of so many places. So what I would say is I think this kind of um, drawing attention to this issue, which brings together people from every single sector, from primary schools, secondary schools, tertiary, um, supplementary schools, etc. I think that's really, really important. I think we have to get together and present how closely related and how important all of these issues are. Thank you. Okay. Well, something. well, everything that's been said, fantastic advice. I would also um, just add, just find ways of celebrating that, that the diversity of languages in whatever communities you represent, because as has been said, we do we do impose sort of hierarchy of languages. Here we are having a session, for example, in English. That's immediately putting English at the top of the agenda. There, our curriculum is still annoyingly set up to favour French, Spanish, <laughs> German. Uh, in, that's in the UK. But behind that, let's find it everywhere we can to so just show whatever language you have is a really valuable asset. I want. I can't speak it. Tell me about it. Um, some some words just show that interest and let these people feel special because I mean, it's particularly I mean multilingualism particularly in this country it's people you know, still think wow you're speaking a language that's amazing um, and you get the red carpet treatment as long as you share that talent that you have in this country in the, most of the rest of the world it's certainly not it's perfectly it's the norm in this country you will get the red carpet treatment let's celebrate it. Thank you very much. And I will finish by saying that language maintenance, as we can see, is being done in different areas, in different sectors. So in schools, 
uh, in supplementary schools, but also, you know, in communities, you know, outside, you know, uh, the UK. So uh, please, you know, keep looking for, you know, information about the LBC, about, you know, uh, the WOLO, and, um, you know, different places where people are working on language, trying to work on language and internet. So thank you very much for coming. And we hope to see you very, very soon for another event on uh, language maintenance or another aspect of uh, language. Thank you. So, um, so the floor is now open for questions. Yeah, question for you actually, because I know you have earlier. And um, number one, why Nepal Do we have Algerians that identity and want to learn like Arabic? Because I heard obviously the French kind of said the Algerians over there, like two generations ago, as prisoners. And so, yeah, did you meet? I watched a documentary the other day, the language minister culture. So, I'm just wondering, did you meet anyone there? Any more language Algerian? No, um, but it's, it's if they, they did you as a prison camp, and, and that I saw when I was there, I saw a very interesting documentary about a woman um, who's trying to escape from a prison camp and, and mm -hmm. they come in forward because they all revolutionaries are sent there uh, and, and they come in forward with, with the local people and there's a long history of, 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 of um, resisting the, the, the French colonialism there as well. Um, now I was more in, uh, I was in very strange village in the north um, where the language is it's still quite um, more or less vital. Children are still more or less learning it, but they're in that situation where, um, um, I'm going to say, where you know, it's not cool to speak their, their home language and, and you, you often hear children speaking to each other in French. Um, why did I go there? Um, yeah, it's, it's what was very interesting was to talk to people. Um, this is it's something we can do as academics. Um, it's just, um, or, or and anybody, raise the question of language. Um, I talked to people in the village there, and they, and they said things like, I've never thought about this issue before. We've never thought about why we speak French in the family rather than our own home languages. Um, you know, why, why, why are we teaching our children just French? Um, at the school, apparently, the, the, the actual policy is now that um, home languages should be encouraged, um, whereas the parents still think the school doesn't allow home languages. So there's a lot of, of a lack of awareness. Yeah, so just talking about this issue is, 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 is really, really important. I went there because I was really going through the Pacific, and I had a friend who was working there, so yeah, it was a good introduction. <laughs> there's a question of the back. Yes. Um, so now I'm going to file the answer. Thank you to the panelists for a very interesting views on language and linguistic diversity in Manchester. Uh, and so I think one of the key uh, points that I was, felt like you were not really uh, tackling was the political environment. You're talking about the linguistic landscape, but you're kind of avoiding the political environment. So I would like to have your views on how the political uh, landscape or environment uh, affects the linguistic landscape and how that leads to uh, some, uh, one of the panelists talked about the shame that some people may feel of using the language in a public space. So I want you to uh, talk a bit about that. Thank you. Okay, I can take that question. The political environment. So the political environments are really different because you can find political environment where uh, speakers of minority languages are oppressed and they do not speak their languages out of, let's say, survival. You also have political environments where some languages are promoted over others. I'm thinking about you know, um, ex colonies, right? So, um, let's say if you take a country like a Francophone country, the official language is in Spanish, it's the language of government business, it's the language that gives you better jobs. The language is kept and is promoted 
right? So in that political environment where the officials have decided to make friends, the language of like social mobility, what happens is that people go to that language. The other thing is that, you know, in an African context, you have um, languages like dominant lingua francas. And in some situations, you have more support for those languages, you know, over the smaller languages. So you find those languages in the media, for example, you know, they're the languages that are used, you know, uh, for government official communication or administration after the official language, right? So in the end, what happens is that you have speakers of minority languages, smaller languages, you know, that are not visible. Right? Visibility is an important thing. I mentioned that when, you know, I was like, you know, asking questions to the whole of people there, helping to make some languages more visible and even smaller languages. When a language is not visible, people tend to feel like this is like a backward language. Mm -hmm. It's a language to be ashamed of, and they don't tend to speak. From a speaker of a very small language spoken by 13,000 people. And you see it a lot. You meet someone in the city, you know, and you try to speak to them in the language, they shift to another one. If you're laughing, it will be self esteem or something like that, right? <laughs> So they shift to a majority language. And that shame is usually because they feel like, you know, they speak an inferior language, right? And all that is like, it's not just political, it's the social political environment. It's also uh, economic, you know, in some, you know, um, uh, context. So that's my answer to that. So if you say that, so you haven't conversation with the same person. The same because point. if you're in a changed environment, you then change Exactly. Okay. So I do, you can grow up with the person, like let's say in the okay. field, speaking the same language, and now playing football and everything. You meet them in the city, they're ashamed to speak the language. The shame comes from somewhere. Yeah. And you were talking about the talking about classroom environment where you have a child, you know, the background. Heritage is like Asian, and when you start telling them you speak Arabic, they say no, I'm English. They deny completely. They don't want to even be associated with that background. I'm British, I'm English. I don't speak any other language. Mm -hmm. So it's, it makes me feel a bit sad. But again, I can't push it. This is what maybe being told by parents just to say you're Italian, you're Spanish, you know, whatever language. But it, it, unfortunately, it just exists. I just, I mean, uh, yes, and I think, for example, in um, Pupils in schools, for example, if I talk about the North Indian community, they are more, they are much more likely to lose their language than Chinese families, for example, because in a sense that's perceived as a global, itself as a global language, therefore it's an asset. Whereas what I speak um, from, from Java may be no, may be no use. In terms of political context here, I think going back to what John was just saying, at the moment, the political context is that somehow or other, if, if a pupil is multilingual, he then comes to be or bilingual, he comes to describe his English as an additional language, and therefore is in some sense a disadvantaged pupil. Mm. Um, whereas the biggest change would be for people realize that actually they have a massive asset. And the foreign office was employing them rather than paying graduates two years to study a language. I used to say to the boys, if you speak Farsi, you should be the next British ambassador in Kabul. Um, because why, why, why should the government pay somebody to trade to a level which you already have? So maybe the tilt in this country is viewing those who are bilingual in a positive rather than an ambivalent or even negative way. Can I just, sorry, yeah, I just want to add one other point, uh, which I think we probably missed, uh, is the importance of the language sometimes in People look at it like the language of science. For example, most of the Arab universities in the Middle East, they teach um, engineering and medicine in English, although it's an art work. So a lot of the time, people put importance in the English language because they look at it like the language of science. Although, if we go back 500 years ago, most of the science actually came from us. And that's why the, when the last uh, Muslim kingdom fell in Spain, uh, 1520, I think, um, a massive uh, campaign of translation, translating all the Arabic science from Arabic into English. And we've forgotten that we gave the world a lot of science, and now we see it in a different language. Right. And you too, very like it. There's a question here. 
who says, do you feel um, these curriculums, curriculum, yeah, GCSE, oh, this I can read it. Uh, should shift to perfect into threat of it. Can you read it for me? <laughs> this is a question from Zoom, from someone from Zoom, Isaac. It's asking, do you feel the GCSE curricula should shift to reflect the language communities of the UK and the surrounding areas of the school? Um, I mean, it would, it would be me out of the job, <laughs> um, which, which I think is a problem because um, it involves you know, who leads um, language courses, who lead, who are the chiefs of exam boards and things. They have vested interest, and that's it's, it's a big it's a big issue. I think ideally, yes, we would be far more flexible to the communities that we represent, so that we can so that we can provide a relevant curriculum. When we talk about language or anything on the curriculum. The more relevant it is for our students, the more effective. Um, but it's just easier said than done because over generations we have been trained as French teachers, Spanish teachers, German teachers, and there just isn't um, isn't the expertise there to to deliver that successfully. However, what we are sort of finding is that sometimes uh, with with this for example that we do. At first, I was thinking, I can't do this because I don't speak these languages that I'm talking about. Okay, I know a bit of Italian, I know a bit of Bi, this because it's a Romance language as well. But the ones which have, which are completely alien to the language that I know, I wouldn't know itself. But actually, what we're finding is actually sharing that, not being the expert is actually okay sometimes, and and being a learner with your students could be a solution. The problem that what you talk about GCC. Gee, there's about to be a new, the new GCC on the horizon for languages. It, it's still rubbish. <laughs> okay, um, GCC is not is is a it creates a ceiling on language. This is this is not this is my view. It creates a ceiling on language learning. It doesn't encourage language learning. It stalls language learning as students learn how to answer this specific type of question. It concentrates on the measurables in languages. For example, it finds things like ooh. Did you use the past tense, the present tense, the future tense, rather than did you communicate effectively? You could be a you could be a brilliant communicator yeah. and achieve less than a grade four or a grade C in all money because you didn't use the different tenses. I mean that's just wrong, isn't it? <laughs> I, don't know. I think school but I think it, I think that what schools are teaching, they are unlikely to change, although it has changed over time with German and there used to be Russian and things like that. So it's over a period of time, but it, as a former head, it's not easy to rearrange your modern language department. But on the other hand, I do think schools could be doing much more with pupils who have knowledge to facilitate, whether it be linking up with supplementary schools, because um, two or three boys a year would off, off their own bat do Arabic or Chinese or something like that. But I, I personally think now, and I'm mainly guilt-ridden for my failures as ten, or ten years of a head, um, I do feel schools can be much more creative in, a, in once again in encouraging those pupils to value those things and forming a means whereby they can get to a stage where they can do GCC. And so with the supplementary schools, I think we, we, we're doing too little. We could add this without necessarily undermining. We, 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 we could, uh, but the idea that the problem, another part of the problem is whilst what's in the supplementary schools is brilliant, uh, early entry for GCC is great. All those entering early are effectively native speakers. Okay. If I'm a non native speaker, I want to be used to Arabic. I'm competing with those students. It's not a level playing field. It's not that attractive. But unfortunately, we need to make a being, yeah, if I want to learn Arabic, if I want to learn Urdu, just because I want to be a part of that wonderful community that I see on my doorstep, it's not easy in our current structure either. Okay. And Chinese language was inaccessible. Um, it, it, it is possible to to, to change things. It's a, it would it would take political will, and mm -hmm. uh, we have to admit that there is racism in there, uh, in the choice of languages that are that are, that are, that are chosen to be counted as important. Um, but it's been done, for example, in Eastern Europe. Um, over just a few years, a lot a whole swathe of schools in Eastern Europe switched from teaching Russian as their main foreign language to English. 
It can be done there, they need to invent it. It could be done here if there was a political will. And the guy said about politics. Well, this is this is this is the, the, the fact. It's it's just that um in the current political climate, you know, certain languages are valued and certain languages are not. Um but but I, I take on board very much what you said about about what GCSE being not about uh, not about speaking languages. Um, it's the, you're talking about the four skills in Europe, and that's it's, it, you know, it's just as important to be able to speak to members of your family, and to have to, to know the internet languages. It is to, to know the, the academic language, and they can be quite different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, well, my question is uh, is about the use of technology. Uh, uh, I'm part of uh, an organization where uh, uh, there are many people from North Africa. Uh, many of them, they live in, uh, in France. Uh, uh, I'm originally from Libya, but you, you should be able to notice that from my, my accent. Um, so sometimes well, we use WhatsApp to communicate with each other. And because they are based in France, um, uh, they use French, obviously, to you know put their comments or whatever. So I don't speak uh, French. So what I do, I copy whatever stuff that they put in, put it on Google's translate translator, and then so that I can understand the, the you know whatever stuff that they put in there. Um, so my question is: Does technology help uh, in terms of learning languages? Because I and now I'm. I, I, I'm not really encouraged to, to learn French because I've got Google Translator to do that. Uh, this is the first um, uh, uh, question. Uh, well, the reason behind that is that the community that I'm trying and part of, and because they are originally from North Africa, uh, we are all Berbers originally uh, from the uh, North Africa, and uh, our language is. Uh, Oppressed by the, the regimes of in North Africa, Libya, Algeria, Morocco, and so on. So uh, we are unable to communicate with our own language because we, you know, uh, we, we speak the language, but it is not written. So that's uh, the, the challenge that we have. So we use either English or French or whatever. So that's it, maybe we use the, uh, the technology in order to communicate and we use other languages. It's for the first time, um, but the, uh, um, because they want to communicate via social media and experiment change with ways of writing their languages. And personally, I'm very much in favor of crowdsourcing in, in that case. Yeah. You know, technology can also, like, you know, is also used by linguists, you know, to write dictionaries, create apps, mm -hmm. you know, um, like, you know, like foreign language languages, but can, it cannot replace, you know, language maintenance at the home level. Mm -hmm. It can only have support to the point, but it cannot replace, uh, you know, mm -hmm. So uh, we are nearly finished. We'll take one last question. And uh, yes, you. And yes, um, I actually had a point against what he said because I learned French fluently off Google Translate. So oh. people used to type to me from France. So when I say people, I mean literally 30 plus people because I went to a village and I met everyone there. And I came back and I literally learned it. I was supposed to be in science, just city crap, but I was there with And I feel like I used Google Translate in a way to help with it. I didn't just copy paste, read it in English and pass it on. I kind of like, so what I kept saying common and I literally ended up learning it fluently, like literally mm -hmm. fluently. So I just feel like it's our brains today and what you know how much time we give to it. So if we really are interested in learning it, then transfer. <laughs> so I don't know, it just depends how you use the technology and if you really are mm -hmm. if you really do want to learn it, everything is there. So I don't know who can push you more than having everything in front of you already, except for your own self. <laughs> John, no, I really agree. I don't, no matter how many times I say it, my students say, don't use Google Translate. They will use Google Translate. <laughs> and it's not there are better online dictionaries, would reference Lingua these sort of things, but they will use Google Translate. It's about accepting that and saying, this is how you use it responsibly. <laughs> <laughs> and the example I give today, for example, 
the word the, the word understanding came up for translation. So Google Translate understanding in Spanish it comes out as comprensión, the first word, comprensión. The Spanish speaking around you, around the around the Google like comprensión is understanding as a noun. Is then quite a good understanding of the situation. Yeah. What in the text it was understanding as an adjective. So she's a very understanding person. So I ended up binning off the lesson that I just planned. <laughs> and we had a lesson on how to use to each other responsibly. And I was planning what's going, so they're gonna use it anyway. Okay, so let's let's yeah, teach them responsible use. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll answer one last question uh, from Denise. Who said that uh, she's from Ghanaian uh, origin and she meets Africans in Europe who lose interest on their languages, mm -hmm. but with uh, the language to their children here. And she wonders if that has to do with uh, their experience, like, you know, back in, like, you know, in their countries, people from ex colonial languages, you know, losing interest in trans um, transmitting their language. I mean, that's very common, right? You find it a lot in uh, people coming from Francophone areas, for example. And it usually has to do with uh, how the language is taught to people, you know, in school. Again, it's a language that has, that, you know, very early children are stopped from speaking their language. I think there was a, someone talked about it right here. So children are punished if they use another language, right? Uh, that's, I mean, that's the system I went through. So people grow up with, first of all, the shame, but also, like, you know, the prestige of that language is also you know, grows into them to the point that when they realize that's a language of social mobility, that's the language of teaching their children. Right? So that's where the interest comes from. And uh, when the lack of interest on so on, the other side from their own language is close from that. One last comment. Then... It, it, people focus a lot on, on the economic value. Um, there are different aspects to learning languages. Um, people in, in the, in the uh, literature, there's things like People identify pride versus profit in terms of language. Pride being um, maintaining your heritage identity, profit being getting a better job, etc. Um, and very similar, um, uh, they've got to me an older framework of, of motivation. So the integrative versus instrumental. So you have to learn a language to join a language community, or you want to learn it to get a better job, etc. Um, and both of those are really important. And people can basically forgetting the soul if 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 they're only only wanting to to learn a language to get a job, um, and that's 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 the worry about relying on schools. I'm afraid as well for language maintenance. Um, people will learn, learn how to talk about science, but not how to, to talk to their friends and their neighbours and their families. So yeah, both, both are really really important. Thank you very much. I think we have to stop here. It was really an interesting debate, and actually, I think it's becoming more and more interesting the more time is like you know time goes, and the more we get to the limit of our time. But I would like to thank everyone for uh, coming to attend this event, and all the panelists. I thank you very much for taking time to be here. I know you're very busy, full time jobs, sometimes double full time jobs, but. <laughs> But uh, thank you very much and see you soon for another event.